Thanks, Burke. Okay, well, let's dive in. We're get, we've got a lot to cover in the next uh, 40 minutes together, so let's get started. We're going to be talking about the OpenMRS 3.0 framework and our collaborative future together. Oh, yes, I think I can't hear you. Thank you, Jan, for mentioning that. Uh, okay, let's see. Let me see. Selective hearing. All right. I think it's can you hear us now? Now I can hear you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Burke. Okay. Let's dive in. Does any of this sound familiar? And please continue to use the chat to let me know what resonates for you and what things stand out. Have you ever heard anyone in OpenMRS say, oh my goodness, it's so much work to get our data exchange working between our different systems? Or man, setting up concepts costs our devs time and it blocks our deployments. I wish our BAs and non-technical people could set up concepts and we could just get going. Or we're duplicating efforts because we can't share front-end features at all. Or gosh, it's hard to find and train OpenMRS developers. Or wow, site setup and configuration takes too much dev and technical effort. Or of course, we all want our healthcare providers to have a great experience and quickly get the information they need at the point of care. So today in this plenary session, I'm gonna walk you through a couple things like the challenges we still face today, some useful ingredients that we're going to be building on, what we still need to do to address these challenges and how this all comes together in the 3.0 framework. We're gonna talk about the implementer implications for this. Uh, we'll have some implementers share what this 3.0 framework is going to mean for them. And we're going to have some breakout sessions. We're going to open up three different breakout rooms divided by region so that we can have some smaller sessions where we can discuss what you hear here today. Well, I'm gonna walk you through this, uh, these different blocks that will represent our 3.0 framework. And during this presentation, if at any time you feel like this, don't worry. If you're feeling like, whoa, our organization has enough trouble as it is. Are you expecting us to start using all of this 3.0 stuff right away? The answer is no, don't worry. If there are things you hear here today that you think would be useful for your implementation, the great news, news about this framework is that you don't need to use all of it to get started and to start adding value for you and your team. So here are the already useful ingredients that I wanted to walk us through before we get started with some of the really new and really exciting stuff. Um, the first one is concept management tooling. So useful ingredient number one, you've heard these quotes all the time, setting up concepts, it costs our dev devs time, it blocks our deployments, we had to start our dictionary from scratch, or I just learned that that organization created almost exactly the same form as we did. Oh, we duplicated work that we could have shared. Well, you're gonna be hearing tomorrow at the showcase demo about the OCL for OpenMRS web app that solves these problems and gives non-technical people like BAs like myself, the ability to manage concepts. So stay tuned for the showcase and demo coming tomorrow. The other useful ingredient that's been going on in the background for a while now in our OpenMRS community is what's happening with FHIR and others have mentioned this so far. Our vision is that we're going to uh, lower the effort that it takes to integrate, make it easier to implement data exchange. And we're gonna move away from creating our own standards to following HL7 FHIR's internationally shared guidance on how healthcare data should be structured and exchanged. Now, what does that actually mean? So uh, if we think about the current state of how people are handling ecosystem integrations, we all know that there's a lot of custom connection work going on. It's made typically one at a time between different specific systems, it tends to be easy to break. And if we're really honest, um, this gets complex enough to be a headache to maintain, let alone change. And so it really ends up being a bit more like this. You end up hooking different pieces up all over the place. But our vision is imagine hooking up the tools that you need just by pointing to one small piece of configuration. So you could give your lab system a URL for OpenMRS and your integration would just work because everything needed for authentication, specific information finding, it's all already categorized and cataloged using Fire. Well, okay, that sounds amazing, Grace, but where are we actually today? Well, we've already set up 
the what we call the fire two module because the first one well we moved on from that so we've called it fire two but this is our fire module and what it does is it maps our bespoke OpenMRS data model to what systems need in fire and this means that adding the fire two module allows you to export data into a fire format that can then be used by other systems and tomorrow at the squad showcase uh, different squad members from the fire squad are going to walk us through how they've actively been using this to see uh, to see data both go to and come from different systems, particularly MPIs and, and, and an SHRE use case as well. So stay tuned for tomorrow as well. Okay, uh, last useful ingredient. In the background, we've also had some really phenomenal contributors working on simplifying our packaging. You know, when we say, hey, everyone, we've upgraded the ref app. And you're like, wow, you know, which of the 40 plus modules have changed? This is a lot to go through. So we've been working through simplifying the number of modules that will really be needed for this core ref app going forward so that you won't have to worry about extra baggage that got included in the ref app that wasn't necessarily needed. Um, the other thing that we're going to be uh, using a bit more of going forward is the initializer module. So if you haven't already heard about that, check that out. I'm not going to go into too much more detail today, but the key point is that it makes it really simple to package your, the configuration that you need to launch your, your distribution. Um, you can read more about that at the phenomenal documentation on GitHub here. So we've just walked through the first three things about the 3.0 framework that, that it kind of relies on, these three useful ingredients. You don't need to be using all of them to use 3.0, but there's some useful things we thought you should know about. There's a particular quote that we now want to focus on when it comes to our 3.0 roadmap. Quote, we are duplicating efforts because we can't share front-end features. Okay, how did we get to where we are today? What are the challenges we're facing? So if we think about our journey at OpenMRS, we started out as being very modular. You know, um, of course, we're all using the OpenMRS platform. Um, people were using the ref app user interface on top of that. And then, of course, everyone knows about how you might use some provided modules from the community, and you may also add on your own custom ones. And so did the organization next to you, and so did the organization next to them. And so that worked for a while, but over the last 10 years, technology has been changing. And uh, so unsurprisingly, technology for web apps in particular has changed. And yet our current ref app 2.x still uses some legacy and bespoke technology. This has meant that instead of all three example organizations here sharing the same front end technology, uh, organizations two and three have needed to change their front end and customize it in order to meet the needs in the field that they're seeing and also work with more modern technology. But this means that it's been hard for different organizations to share front-end work across each other. And it's only created a growing divide that continues to grow today. So what's the result? Well, I think we're all familiar with this. Redundant development efforts, duplicated front-end feature development, and it's harder to create solutions that can be reused. Of course, we're all here to make patient care better. So we need a system that will make it easier for us to give clinicians what they need to make patient care better faster. So the key point here is that with our current front end technology as it is, we are missing out on opportunities for collaboration. There's some additional problems that I hinted at earlier. For example, the UX isn't consistent across implementations. So even if technically you could share a front end, you probably wouldn't want to share some of those front end features because it looks so different from another organization. Um, another one is that OpenMRS devs can be really hard to find. This is not only a challenge for implementers, it's also a sustainability concern for us as a community. And uh, of course, we hear often that front-end releases are stressful, like single page applications on their own. They're very fragile, easy to break. Making a change in one piece of code here has other effects that you might even miss despite painful manual quality assurance. Okay, what do we need to do to address these challenges? Well, we want a framework that will allow many organizations to work together seamlessly. And we want to modernize our tech stack. We want to make it easier for implementers to do incremental improvements uh, so that you can release confidently without uh, continuously being afraid that you've broken something. We also want to appeal to a global talent pool of devs who are comfortable in JS frameworks and other modern front end development. We want to obviously ensure interoperability and finally and critically, 
we want to focus on user experience. And we're going to be talking about that more shortly here. So what exactly is this 3.0 framework that we're growing on? Let's dive into that now. So the first and foundational block is plug and play front end architecture. The new front end architecture that we've been building, it enables the reduction of duplication of front end development. This is because different code teams uh, can effectively be sandboxed and can work independently on features and widgets. We're also going to see that today. And yet the framework brings the work together. So the micro front end squad is the squad that's been working on this plug and play architecture. The next key block of the 3.0 framework is implementer tooling. We've repeatedly heard that one of the challenges is setting things up at the sites and we need lower tech configuration for, so that it's easier to uh, adjust the configuration for sites needs, even if you don't have a highly skilled developer on site. And we're going to look more at what those implementer tools look like. I'll give you a quick demo of those as well today. We also need a UX framework. This would allow us to share front end features globally with a consistent and professional UX that's actually faster to work with. And we'll go through that too. And finally, all of this comes together in a 3.0 ref app. And just like before, you don't necessarily need to use the recommended reference application. And yet it's something that we're working towards together so that it's available. And this is what it looks like so far. Um, these are the wireframes for the 3.0 reference application that we've been working through. And we'll break this down together to understand the front end architecture behind this and how it gets put together. And we'll also uh, understand why did we end up using designs that looked like this? How is this going to move us forward together faster? One key thing to notice here is the tablet on the right hand side. We've been focusing on tablet based workflows first. And then we move to desktop. And the goal of that is number one, to have a system that uh, intuitively feels touchable from the start, especially if your users aren't used to using mouses right away. Um, and secondly, because we, we know that uh, tablet use is, is growing in demand. So let's do a quick demo. If you are looking at this thinking, wow, you know, we've got a lot of custom stuff. I can't imagine it working well here. Well, let me show you something kind of neat. So this is a demo environment using the 3.0 ref app. And you can see that I've suddenly switched here into the legacy admin page. And the reason we have it set up that way is because we have not yet redesigned the legacy admin page. That hasn't been a top priority. But the nice thing about micro front ends is that you can still connect things so that you can, you can use your old functionality. And this is actually the reason why our micro front end technology is already being used by several implementers just without the new front end. Uh, because it allows them to still use old uh, pieces of their application seamlessly. So this uh, visual that I've shown you, let's walk through how this gets built using micro front ends. I think you'll find it really interesting. So we're looking right now at a structure of an example patient page. So how is Agnes's page built? Well, there's a couple key terminologies to know here. So we've got a global header. We've got some app navigation where I can switch between different key things I might need to do. And I've also got a left navigation and a body where I can review data about Agnes. I can see uh, her main demographic information. And then I've got a workspace on the right that I can open up to do different actions. Now, um, this is all driven by something that we call slots. And slots are going to be really interesting because uh, you'll, you'll have a slot here that says, hey, you can put widgets in here for navigation have a slot here that says, hey, you can put widgets in here for app navigation, or you have widgets, uh, or you have a slot here where you can add widgets for what you want to see in the body here. Maybe you want to see a particular patient chart widget. Okay, how does this all come together, these extensions and these slots? So let's imagine that I want a couple things in my application. I want a patient summary widget, I want vital signs, I want labs, and I want to be able to search for patients. These are all added to these different slots. Um, by just the, the extension itself, when you add it to your application, it knows where to go. And so, uh, for example, this uh, group has added the patient summary extension, and it's automatically created some navigation for itself, as well as a, a body here. They've also added the vital signs widget, and they've added a lab results widget. And these have also created the little tables that you want to see in the summary, and it's created the master pages that you would want to see uh, for vital signs or labs. 
and you can see the little search guy up here too. Now, each of these widgets individually informed the slots to say, hey, this should go here, both in the navigation and in the chart review area. Uh, so what if you want your extensions to come from multiple repos? No problem, it's designed for that. So let's say you say to yourself, well, we like some of the standard extensions coming out of maybe an OpenMRS squad, but we really want to add our own custom lab results widget. No problem. You simply create a widget and uh, add the slot name to it, and then it'll show up exactly where you want in the right slot. But what if you want an extension from another organization? Also no problem. You might say, hey, organization B did a really nice immunization widget. I'd really like to slap that into my application. And that, that's also possible in this framework. So I wanna quickly show you the implementer tools piece as well, because this, this is pretty cool. So I'm going to actually uh, exit the application and show you uh, the real deal. So I'm currently looking at our demo environment for the 3.0 framework. And because I'm an admin, I'm going to turn on this little implementer tool guy here. And now I have the ability to see a bunch of things. If I turn on this UI editor, I can actually see the slot. So you, now I can see, ooh, there's a slot here. So if I wanted to add more boxes, more options for my users, this is the slot I would put those widgets in. I can see a slot up here. So um, that, that just gives you a UI to see what's going on in this page. But let's say that I'm at a site and I go, ooh, you know what? At our site, I really don't want people to be able to click the system administration button or the data management button. And I really don't want them configuring metadata. Thank you. So uh, no problem. Let's go in and configure that. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove these different options. So let's remove data management, let's remove system administration, and let's save that. All right, and let's refresh our page and see what happened. <laughs> God love live demos. All right, you can see that uh, the different widgets have disappeared, and I can actually download this config JSON file. Uh, let's say that I wanted all other sites to use this particular configuration, and this will generate a JSON file that I can use. Now, if I decided that was a horrible mistake, no problem. I'm just going to clear that configuration that I just made, and uh, we'll refresh again, and all of those widgets will return. And so that's the power of these uh, implementer tools when it comes to rapid configuration. You can imagine this being used um, further. I'll just go back into presentation mode here. You can imagine these being used to drive uh, what things you want to show up at your site's dashboard. Um, so for example, I'd like to see this widget, um, but I'd also like to see this one. This could also be easily configured with the implementer tools. Now let's tie all of this together. And you can imagine that one day we could have a marketplace where you could easily find the front end features that you need and also showcase your team's expertise. Uh, so here's a really um, rough <laughs> mock up, but you could imagine seeing, oh, hey, look, this service provider uh, has put together a really nice immunization tracker. Maybe we could add that to our EMR. Let's have a look at it. And it would all be as painless as you've seen here. But that requires some shared things when it comes to the user experience. We've talked before about how it could be a bit jarring. So let's talk about why we picked the carbon design system to be our shared UX framework. Um, this is something that we're, we're, we've been experimenting on for the last uh, eight months or so. Why did we choose a third party design system? So the first reason was because we don't have many dev resources. We all share that problem. And we definitely don't have many um, skilled and, and consistent UX designer resources throughout the community. So we really wanted to make the most of dev and design time when it comes along. The second reason is the cost of maintenance. The folk style guides tend not to be maintained as it is, and they also don't solve the question of how something should be implemented. And so someone might implement something that seemed clear in the style guide, but in fact, it ends up requiring costly engineering rework because the dev guidance just wasn't so clear for that component. And finally, the user experience. We chose this because our users want a consistent and professional front end UI. And when you choose a third party design system, there's already a lot of thought that's gone in to creating that when it comes to giving users a good experience. So let's look at a couple examples that we worked through when we were trying to pick an option. 
This is an example of a form that's been made with some unclear structure and unclear uh, guidance. So, you know, there's colored text here, but there's extra spacing here. It's not really aligned properly. There's caps, there's no caps, there's massive spacing. I have to go all the way over here to find the space, but uh, the save button. Okay, let's look at how that could look if we used a third party design system. So we looked at some like uh, Lightning, Atlassian's design guide and uh, Carbon. We also looked at others too, uh, like Bootstrap, uh, and, and more, uh, but this is how a form like that could look. And then we took it a step further and we made some different uh, mockups uh, of patient charts using these different systems. And we found that carbon allowed us to have quite a lot of information density without distracting you from the main things that you might wanna be reviewing about your patient. So this is carbon design system. They've got uh, heaps of documentation that walks you through both what something should look like and how to implement a component. And that is what has brought us here today to these wireframes for our 3.0 ref app. The other thing that we've been really thoughtful about is white labeling. We know that people are working for clients. Uh, you need to show your brand or your client's brand. You need to reflect their branding colors. And we've set it up so that that will actually be quite uh, relatively simple to do, changing logos, changing colors to fit branding. Let's have a quick look at the prototype and then, uh, and then we'll move on. So uh, here is a prototype. We've also got a demo environment that we'll walk through. I, I showed you a sneak peek of it today, but we'll walk through it in more detail tomorrow at the microfinance lab showcase. So another pitch for attending the showcases tomorrow. Don't say on me now, network. One of the key things that we've been doing uh, is consistent user testing. So once we get a design to a point where we've done a couple of rounds of user, uh, user validation, user research first, and then uh, user testing, we'll set up a clickable prototype for some of our more complex features like drug orders. And then we'll walk through that clickable prototype with users in the field. Uh, so this is, this is an example. So you can see I'm looking at Agnes's chart. I've opened my drug order basket for her. Um, I might want to search for a new patient up here. I might need to uh, go to a different area of her chart. Let's look at her, oops, I've got it into a bad state here. Uh, let's go to the vitals and you can see her vitals page. Uh, let's have a look at previous drug orders and so on. Well, these are all of the key things that create this 3.0 framework and future that we're following together. And I hope it's clear how this is not a uh, mandatory package deal, but working together, this really unlocks a collaborative future for us. If you'd like to learn more about how uh, this whole 3.0 thing came together, how it's currently being developed, how you could contribute, we've got quite a lot of documentation on this, as well as uh, continually growing and improving dev get started guides. So simply go to om.rs forward slash about MFE. Now, the key point is that you make all this possible. We could not be doing this without the incredible implementers that join our community and volunteers who are all pitching in to make this possible. So thank you. So now let's hear from some implementers. I've asked a couple people who um, have been particularly keen on what 3.0 is gonna mean for their organization to share with us for about two minutes each. What exactly does this 3.0 framework mean for you and your organization? So uh, let's get started with JJ. Uh, JJ, what does this mean for you and your team at Ampath? Okay, I think we're having some audio problems there. Hey, Unless, sorry oh, about oh, that. There we go. Um, no thanks, Grace, for this excellent. Um, overview and presentation of uh, this framework um, and all the work that's gone into it for the past year. Um, for Ampath, um, many or several years ago, we developed a, my video, um, we developed uh, a, a point of care um, web app uh, on top of OpenMRS using Angular. Um, and although at the time it felt like a good idea to create uh, of our own bespoke um, application, um, after a bit of time of implementation, we, uh, in, uh, in the setting of increased needs, um, 
we recognized that we had challenges maintaining our application and that we weren't able to benefit from the remainder of the OpenMRS community. Um, and this was one of the key drivers for our involvement in the OpenMRS 3.0 um, project early on. Um, although it's taken uh, perhaps more time than we had originally hoped for, um, given that other um, world changing events um, happened in the past year, um, uh, we're excited that we're finally seeing this to be close to, uh, or it is nearly close to a deployable state for us. Um, and we're hoping that um, sometime over the next few months, we will start the um, kind of steady migration from our current application to um, using uh, uh, this 3.0 framework. Um, and for those who aren't, aware, aren't familiar with AMPATH, um, one of our primary um, interests is within, with HIV. Um, we're a, a PEPFAR-supported uh, uh, HIV care and treatment program um, in Western Kenya. Um, and so we anticipate kind of uh, integrating kind of various micro front ends a few at a time over the next couple of months um, with the hope that by the end of the year, we'll have our entire system, which is consists of um, around 50 sites and several hundred users who primarily use tablets um, migrated to the 3.0 framework um, as the primary means for accessing OpenMRI. Thanks. Unmute. Thank you, JJ, really appreciate it. Um, right, so uh, next, uh, Dimitri from Mecom, we'd love to hear what this means for your organization. Thanks, Grace. Um, yeah, for us, it's, uh, I think, before all, joining a really active collaboration um, group, collaborative group in developing this product. Like, uh, I think we've implicitly worked with MPAS and PIH over the years on many different things, and we really wanted to, to do it actively on a clear project with a, a shared target. And so that would be the next generation of, Open, of OpenMRS, the 3.0. Um, and we've been enjoying it so far very well because, yeah, these guys are amazing. And I think it's a great, it's a great opportunity, opportunity to develop together. Uh, as for the product itself, like there's a many reasons why we are interested in having this OpenMRS 2.0 up and running. And really, as JJ just said, like uh, we are probably a, a, later than what we wish we would have been. So I'm hoping this is really going to come to life in the next few months. It's about having a modern um responsive app as you said that works on tablets that has a really sexy ui that was that was really well thought through uh kudos to kiaran the ux designer was doing an amazing job at this and it makes a huge difference it's really an appealing product and we hope it's going to be disruptive i mean that's the reason why we are so invested in it and then there's some other so, some other aspects we are working hard as you know to make it super lightweight this will run on only a couple of modules is very different to what we've known with BAMNI or with the reference application 2.x. This is this is very different as an experience in terms of deployment, the ability to run it on lighter hardware. We are very invested in the humanitarian field with uh, portable devices that need to run minimal, I mean, as, 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 as minimal as possible package of software. And I think we can achieve it with 3.0. And then of course, uh, yeah, the, the, the the interoperability part the fact that it's it's coming now with the fire two module so again here kudos to kudos to Jan for this it's, like, it's really amazing to be able to rely on it every time we need to do some some integration with other systems and knowing that the fire resource will be available and we can use it so yeah so that that's about it thanks so much Dimitri and actually, Dimitri raises a really good point that I forgot to mention, and that's that the work that's been done so far on 3.0, uh, the Ref App, has all like we've we've really tried tried to call the Fire API first before going to the REST API. And what's particularly exciting about that for our future is that uh, one day when we do have other data sources that aren't the aren't from the OpenMRS backend, those data sources will be able to display in our EMR. Uh, directly, even if even if the the data that you're querying is not from OpenMRS, uh, that's really exciting. Mike from Partners in Health, what does this mean for your organization? 
Thanks, Chris. Hey, can you guys hear me? Okay. Hello? Yes, we can. Oh, good. Sorry, I've been having mic problems. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you guys said it really well. Um, and, you know, Grace, I think your, your presentation and your slides, I mean, they resonated with me, um, you know, specifically. Uh, you know, I think Partners in Health, we, we support a lot of different implementations around the world and in many different countries. We work closely with Ministries of Health um, and other partners, you know, and, you know, are really trying to enable, uh, you know, those implementations to be successful um, and to, you know, to build up their own, you know, their own successful implementations themselves. Um, and I think, you know, we were, you know, a, a big part of the original 2.x reference application and, and the current framework that we have in place. We, you know, invested heavily in that, um, kicking that off within, you know, our Mirabai implementation in Haiti um, and have been very successful in scaling that out to other countries. Um, but, you know, I think we, we recognized, you know, many years ago that, that that had, you know, a limited shelf life in terms of the, the technologies that we were using and how accessible they were to people. Um, you know, they really required specific knowledge of, of, within OpenMRS to, to gain expertise in. They required, you know, really Java development skills um, as their, you know, so server-side vendor technology. Um, and so, and we saw other groups, you know, having success, especially at the point of care uh, with, with, you know, more front end technologies. So we had, you know, we saw the growth of Bomni, uh, Ampath had a very successful, um, you know, uh, Angular based system. Um, and we built some things ourselves, you know, over the last couple of years that, that were like that for very specific purposes in certain countries. For example, in Malawi, we built a, an application for, for doing uh, screening within an integrated uh, health clinic and have had success with that. I think what what were the some of the challenges we saw there were just you know both lack of expertise on our end in terms of knowing exactly how to build these new applications as well as lack of broad community support for what we developed and i think you know empath is you know if not to put words in jj's mouth i think you know that same lack of community support is sort of one of the one of the main drivers for them as well where you know what we want to do is achieve some of those same benefits but to do it as a community to work together and to collaborate and to sort of, you know do more together than we could possibly do ourselves, and you know to gain, lean on the expertise of of those who may know some of these areas more than we do, and then to build on top of those frameworks uh, successfully. So, um, you know, I'm really excited for it. I'm really hopeful that you know, given the technologies that we're using, that we'll be able to capacitate um, a much broader group of of our own staff and and future staff to you know and and partners to sort of lead their own implementations because we're not you know using sort of bespoke technologies that require you know open mrs specific documentation uh to learn and you know so i'm, I'm really excited about you know, where this is leading us and we're hoping to you know continue to do more and more with with this framework in the coming in the coming year and years awesome thanks so much mike great oops great story and background and actually, it's a perfect segue. Um, Stephen Wanier from IntelliSoft, would you like to share with us, for you, what does the 3.0 framework mean? Thanks a lot, Grace. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, just again, just amplifying what um, uh, JJ, Dimitri, um, and, and Mike mentioned. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I think I'll say at a personal level, I've been privileged to be part of OpenMRS for a long time. And uh, and I think, you know, looking back into, into, into uh, so like my personal journey from when I was working for iTech and we built Kenya EMR and we had to develop a custom UI. You know, there's plenty of folks here, uh, Jen Antila, Jan Flowers, and many others, uh, you know, back Paul, um, who supported us quite a lot, uh, you know, and we did what we, what we had to do at that time and did it really well. Uh, but it was also very, very painful, uh, you know, just to continue maintaining our own uh, custom UI. And this is just for one country, uh, you know, we had a target of implementing this in, uh, so many facilities, but by the time we're getting to 20, we could feel the pain already, uh, you know, and 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 then uh, we could um, additionally we could we, we could actually not um, collaborate with anyone else outside Kenya, you know, because we we had taken our you know we had forked our own route and gone our own way, right? In that sense, so I think um, Open 3.0, uh, you know, and, and and the framework that we're working within definitely helps a lot uh, for me very practically. Uh, but then I would say I think uh, from Intel's perspective. 
you know, uh, we recognize that uh, that uh, the OpenMR 3.0 framework is designed with a futuristic mindset, with sustainability at the core of its intentions. And some of those the intentional decisions um, will benefit us very practically. Um, and I'd like to describe this in two ways. Uh, from a technical perspective, um, the modular front-end approach to development uh, means that uh, the framework allows us to build front-end widgets without limit limiting us um, on the front-end technology to use, which means that we'll have flexibility in extending the app um, or building new user interfaces for local implementations. And then secondly, the fire fast approach to data flow implementation means that uh, it will make it easier for us to integrate with other systems using a future-proof standards-based approach. Um, and I think this, as you mentioned, thereby, uh, you know, break down a lot of unnecessary heavy lifting in the future because, you know, we are heading out in the right direction from the onset. Uh, strategically, uh, it means that because there's a very heavy implementer guided approach to prioritization, it means that we have an opportunity to shape, to shape the direction of the implementation based on the needs that uh, we may require to address as an implementer uh, in Kenya and in the region. And also it means that uh, the participation in the development and implementation of the framework means that you will have uh, an even greater opportunity to contribute to the community and also build our own internal capacity to support uh, other projects, you know, like, the, like those in the future. Um, you know, so, so we definitely see uh, very, very clear opportunities. And then I think I would say, um, kind of like finally, is uh, you mentioned Grace about uh, skilled labor. Um, I, I think uh, you only need to work in, um, in geographies like where you work to realize that we actually don't have a lot of skilled um, open MRS developers. They're just not enough to go around. And um, it's very frustrating. Um, and you get in this vicious cycle where you're unable to deliver um, quality products because you just don't have enough skilled labor around. And so the fact that this allows us to use the best of available talent technologically uh, without being limited to a certain technology and, uh, and thinking means that we can do a better job uh, with a lot less. And then I think lastly, so I'm gonna make a statement that Buck mentioned earlier in his uh, opening remarks about um, the framework, in my opinion, I, I look at this framework as the, as the glue that strengthens the open MRS community fabric even further. You know, that we can work in our sandboxes, but we are so tightly cohesive, yet um, loosely connected in that sense. Thanks a lot, Grace. Thank you so much. That was a phenomenal note to start to wrap up on. So well said, Stephen, much appreciated. Thank you all of our implementers for sharing that. And next up, well, we want to hear from you. Um, we, so anytime you have feedback about this, especially any feedback you're not really comfortable saying directly, we would love to hear what you have to say. Um, I'm just gonna put the link to this survey here in the chat. And at any time you can send us, here's my serious question or serious concern, or here's what I loved. Um, we'd love to hear from you there. However, what we're gonna do next in just a moment is we're going to have our breakout discussions. So we're going to ask people to self-select into a particular region uh, and you'll be able to kind of share what are some questions, concerns, thoughts that came up for you in hearing about the 3.0 framework. But first, before we do that, uh, let's learn more about the OpenMRS HIV Reference Implementation Project or ORI or ORI. Uh, so I'm gonna hand it over to Fiddy Weissglass for a moment from UCSF to walk us through that for the next five to 10 minutes. And then we will move over to the breakout sessions. Over to you, Fiddy. Thank you, Grace. Yeah, I think the jury is still out on whether it's Ori or Ori. I say Ori, but uh, both will work. Um, good afternoon, good morning, everybody. My name is Fiti Reisklaus. I'm with the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, briefly introducing Ori, which is a project implemented by the University of California, San Francisco, Macquarie University in Kampala, and the University of Nairobi. We're also collaborating with two other awardees of this grant path and Jembi. Uh, and these three uh, groups are funded by CDC. And on the right are some of the people in our team and we're still in the process of adding more. So what is Ori? Ori kind of grew out of a need uh, from PEPFAR or CDC through the fact that a lot of countries share common needs in a collection management analysis and reporting and use of individual level data for their HIV clients. Um, and to do that, they have, as we all know, EMRs, uh, often based on OpenMRS. 
But even though there's a common need, PEPFAR supported countries have built these in silos without standards, leading to different approaches, uh, solving a similar problem in different ways. It's duplicative, it's inefficient. Um, as a result, innovations in one system cannot be easily, if at all, reused by other systems and countries. And the same applies to the data. So the vision for ORI, as was defined by CDC, is a standards-based generic electronic medical record based on OpenMRS, supporting primarily the delivery of HIV services, uh, and whereby we will incorporate the best programmatic, technological standards and data management practices, focusing on the most common use cases in HIV care and automated data exchange scenarios with the idea that these can be further enhanced, adapted and customized and adopted by any PEPFAR supported country or non PEPFAR supported country for that matter. Um, ensuring high levels of data security and patient confidentiality and leveraging the wider OpenMRS community for its continued and sustained development. To put it differently, ORI is seen by CDC as the future of OpenMRS for HIV. It's a generic version of OpenMRS dedicated to HIV in PEPFAR supported countries. So it will support the most common HIV program requirements right out of the box. Um, it's to be customized and extended further by countries. It will promote resource sharing across countries, kind of with a philosophy to develop this once and use it everywhere. Now we're currently in the process of scoping ORI, so defining what goes into ORI, and these are all the, 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 the functionalities that we've kind of identified that ORI needs to support. We broke them up into four categories, programmatic, this is where you'll find all the different aspects of HIV programming, such as HIV testing, care and treatments, vital events, laboratory services, drug and yes, ART yes. prescriptions. Somebody. Sorry. Um, surveillance uh, and other aspects of HIV uh, programming. The workflow, uh, one of the most exciting things probably about ORI is point of care support, which is what many countries are moving towards, but there will still be support for retrospective data entry, uh, clinical workflows, biometrics, such as fingerprints, SMS reminders for appointments and appointment scheduling. Data management, uh, this is primarily reporting, aggregate reporting for PEPFAR, national HMIS, cohorts, cascade reports, CQI, case reports, and an interaction with other systems so that some of these reports can be uh, generated and shared automatically, but also shared health record exchanges uh, for case-based surveillance, interaction with pharmacy systems, lab systems, lab uh, reference systems. The first version of ORI is projected to be ready by October of this year. It will not have everything that I just show you. It will just have a subset. Um, it's the minimum viable product and it will primarily focus on HIV testing and care and treatment. HIV testing, point of care and retrospective and care and treatment retrospective and then lab results and drug prescriptions primarily focusing on ART regimens and CD4 and viral loads and some basic reports and then it will be extended further through the course of next year. So as we were, um, it's kind of interesting how this went with OpenMRS 3.0, as we were thinking about what to overcome some of these challenges of OpenMRS in the past and how to mitigate that, we came up with what we call the Ori Foundation and OpenMRS is coming up with the OpenMRS 3.0 platform. And the idea is really that we, for ourselves, needed a certain way to do certain things. Um, for example, form design, data management, um, concept management. So we came up with the idea of the ORI Foundation, which is a set of designs and practices and principles and technology approaches utilized by ORI and related components. You can see here that ORI in the left corner is the HIV component, but we can add other programs areas and service areas such as COVID, 
MCH and TB on it. And the idea is that they will kind of use the same approaches to, to develop and customize OpenMRS for these specific disease areas. So it's not really a platform, it's, nor is it a physical layer, it's really an agreed set of principles. Um, and as OpenMRS 3.0 is progressing, we're seeing that some of these will likely be part of the OpenMRS 3.0 platform. So the boundary between these two is vague, and I kind of hope that much of the Ori Foundation will actually become part of OpenMRS 3.0 so that we do not have to worry too much about some of these things. But some of the things that we do need to think about and that we hope OpenMRS 3.0 can uh, really help us think through and that we're really excited about are the user interface, which Grace has just presented. Um, so we're going with the microphones and, and carbon, a form builder technology, um, some way to do database flattening to really enhance analysis and reporting and also persist computed metrics such as your viral load uh, suppression status. A better way, Grace already talked about this as well, uh, for some of the metadata management um, such as concepts and we are going to use the OCL for that. DevOps, how can we make the deployment easier and a uh, data exchange approach to interact with other systems. And we have a wiki where you can read all this and a lot more in much more detail, including detailed scope. And you can sign up using this link. I will post this in the chat. And um, yeah, uh, feel free to ask me any questions. And you can read a lot more about Ori uh, on this wiki. Thank you. Back to awesome. Grace. Thanks so much, Fiddy. Really appreciate that overview. Um, I think. Yeah, it, it's important that we're uh, getting everyone on the same page about what Ori is and uh, talking through this together. And we're really thrilled to be working on the 3.0 framework together with you. So uh, next up. So as I said, we want to hear what people think about the 3.0 framework. Uh, there's that anonymous survey link again. You can use that anytime. But now we're going to jump into some breakout rooms. There are three rooms set up. And you'll be able to see them by clicking the more option at the bottom of your screen. And you can go ahead and go down to uh, scroll down to either West, East, uh, West Central or East Southern Africa or Asia and just click the join button. If you're not directly from one of those regions, that's fine. And join one of the rooms that is of the most interest to you. And we'll be talking through three questions. Number one, what are the things that excite you about 3.0? Number two, what things concern you? And number three, which of you will present uh, a summary of what was shared anonymously to the big group uh, after the break? So we'll do this um, breakout session together right now, and then we'll have a short break and we'll come back together and we'll have one person from each group summarize what was shared in those groups so that we can all hear it together. Okay, welcome back everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, so what we'll do next is we'll ask one person from each group to share what was shared in the breakout sessions. And then after that, uh, we are going to dive into some exciting lightning talks. So first up, uh, let's hear from the, I believe, East and South Africa uh, group. I think Tendo has something to share before, before your laptop battery dies. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, excited to be here. Am I audible? Yes, perfectly. Yes. Okay, thank you. So this is Eastern Southern Africa. They came up with a couple of questions to, you know, to help us guide the discussion. So the first one was what excites you about 3.0? And a couple of people highlighted. Uh, the first one was uh, that there is an expansion of, uh, of the pool of skilled developers. And um, the person that raised this, I think Steven said, it's beneficial for the companies that are looking for, for or that have targets to, to beat, and yet they need to, you know, to, to deploy, 
deploy out as much as possible. So that, that was one of the, the benefits. Then the other one was uh, provision of components for rapid development. That is, there is now the ability to use uh, components that's been developed by a pool of other developers. That is the other thing that excited people about 3.0. Then the other thing is uh, interoperability and uh, I believe system, system integration interoperability and system integration with uh, with other systems. Someone, I think earlier mentioned something to do with fire, the fire component that comes or that ships with 3.0. Yes, those were some of the, the, the things that excite people about 3.0. However, it also came with some challenges or concerns. People had some concerns. First one was the migration process. Uh, ideally, people right now are using older stack, as we earlier saw. Uh, 2.0, that's for the platform, and maybe the, the ref app, and some others are even on much older technologies. So the migration process may not come uh, as easy as we expect. There can there, there will be some 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 mountain to climb. Uh, Stephen mentioned that there is uh, people ideally looking for things that are working and they're not so much interested. Okay, technology may not be like their first priority. So that is a thing to, to think about. Then the other thing was about the learning curve. Uh, this was an experience from the developer's side, but also, uh, okay, majorly the developer's side. So there is a steep learning curve uh, migrating from the traditional uh, server side rendering to client side technologies may come uh, at a cost for the developers. Then finally, uh, someone asked a question that, and I think this was specific for implementers, I don't know um, about others, how do ministries of health, equipped devs or developers in academic institutions uh, to essentially level up. There are a couple of reactions from, from Jen on the community level and back. So maybe I'll also give him a chance to say a few words. Uh, but Jen essentially said uh, the community is trying to handle that through uh, the dev stages and the academy squad, the GSOC uh, project in order to see that devs can quickly level up and be able to deliver the solutions. Yes, so that is it from the East and Southern Africa breakout. Awesome, thank you for that summary, Kendo. Uh, when you yeah. mentioned um, migrating from server side to client side may come at cost for devs, do you mean in terms of a learning cost or what kind of cost did, uh, did you mean? Uh, the, you mean the first point about uh, about migration? You mean the migration bit? Uh, you mentioned, so when you're talking about the learning curve for new devs. Oh, the learning curve, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that came as an experience from my side because I've done some little development there and there is some steep learning curve previously it used to be java java server side you know client uh sorry ui rendering but right now it's client side totally different stack someone has to learn react someone has to learn carbon and if they have no prior experience to that they may they it may take them some time to like get on board uh aside things aside learning uh, the, the whole workflow also because the architecture of uh, 2.x and 3.0 are slightly or totally different mm -hmm. so that yes thank you so very much that is what i want to pass on well said thank you very much tendo really appreciate that yes i guess i'm done awesome okay well uh next up uh ellen ball would you like to share from the West and Central Africa breakout group. Um, we had a small but good group. Uh, 
apologies for representing an area of the world that I don't live in, but I, but I love anyway. Um, things that excited the, the, the group of people were the UI, um, OHRI project, that it um, has the potential of being a real project to, I know it's a real project, but that it'll help accelerate 3.0 and um, bring it into the, the real world. Um, for groups looking for point of care, uh, it seems like 3.0 will definitely help that, that there's denser information display, uh, feedback from users are, I wanna see everything and I can't find data uh, that I've been entering, especially things like medications um, and being able to quickly meet the use case of clinicians who say, I need this now. Uh, concerns, uh, we, so this was my concern. Uh, we wish this was available years ago um, because we're currently on the ground and we've been on the ground for a long time. Um, and I think if it was available now, we would certainly use it. Um, how much work will this be and what time and disruption will it take to switch to 3.0? What, uh, the next concern, when feature development is easier, how will we ensure that we're still using good design practices and a good design process so that widgets are also designed well? And we still need to answer questions about reporting. Um, how do you integrate an analytics tool or a dashboard where clinicians could see indicators, um, something clinicians can refer to to help with decisions. Awesome, thanks so much, Ellen. Really appreciate that. All right, and uh, next up, our group from Asia. Who would like to uh, share the feedback from the Asia breakout room? Hi, uh, Sanjay, can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Yeah, so we had a small group uh, 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 discussing about the open MS uh, 3.0 and basically we try to align with uh, how we can leverage the features that's coming up with the 3.0 because the number of implementation that we have here is uh, very few and it's also with the BAMI so probably the challenge would be to migrate the existing system to 3.0 uh, in the uh, migration side uh, at the same time uh, uh, as Ministry of Health has envisioned the Health Information Exchange uh, interoperability framework as well, and uh, it would be uh, opportunity as well as the challenge that uh, uh, to incorporate the features that that's coming up with Open Open MS 3.0. And the concern is uh, uh, if the implementation uh, that's going on right now, if we can't uh, follow with the 3.0, then it will be definitely the overhead uh, operational for, for, the, for the migration at the later time. So I think that's the concern for now. Um, and uh, moreover, uh, the opportunity that we, are, we would also like to take is the terminology, uh, basically OCL, in, in, OCL uh, implementation for the all of the coming up new implementation that we have thought of. So these were the basic points that we had discussed in the group. Sorry, Sanjay, let me make sure I captured the concept management piece correctly. So the, the feedback was that the concept management 
um, solutions look interesting. Is that right? Yeah, basically this, uh, I would like to add this as an opportunity that for all the implementers and how we can incorporate the OSHIO. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah. Right, regardless of which distribution or system you're currently using. Right, right. Awesome, well said. Thank you so much, Sanjay. And thank you everyone. Um, really appreciated everyone's time and attention talking through this today. And again, if you have any additional concerns that maybe you weren't comfortable sharing today publicly, you can submit those anonymously at uh, om.rs forward slash three feedback. Um, so I just shared that link in the chat there. And we'd love to hear from you. Okay, well, on that note, um, what I'll do with this board is we'll, we'll group things into some themes. It sounds like there's a very common theme of the question about the migration process across all the different groups. Um, and, and so that's really helpful to know that that's something we need to address together. I'll now hand it over to Jen and Christine to take us into the lightning talks today. <laughs>